and we'll get started. Uh, so tonight is Families for Everglades, Mangroves, Superheroes of the Seashore. We're going to learn all about these incredible plants. So mangroves are extraordinary in many ways and truly are superheroes of the plant world. So tonight we're going to learn a little bit more about what makes them so important to this ecosystem. But first we have to learn what is a mangrove? Now a mangrove is a tropical plant that is adapted to loose wet soils, salt water, and being periodically submerged by tides. Mangroves in the Everglades supports over 550 square miles of mangroves. It's the largest mangrove forest in the continental United States. And mangrove, mangroves provide for us ecosystem services, these natural benefits to human from nature. So quick introduction, my name is Kim Gooch. I'm the digital marketing coordinator for the Everglades Foundation. You might have recognized me from previous families for Everglades, as well as a previous education coordinator in Orlando. We are also joined tonight by Dr. Minakshi Chaba. She's the ecosystem and resilient scientist. So she'll be on in just a little bit to help answer some questions about mangroves. So some quick housekeeping rules and some webinar guidelines. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A feature on the webinar. We're also going to be utilizing polls for trivia questions throughout the evening. And if you take any pictures or if you wanna follow us and tag us on social media, please use the handles on the screen. All right, so we're gonna start with our first trivia poll. I'm gonna launch it on the screen. And the question is, how many main species of mangroves are found in the Everglades? Is it one, two, three, or four? So go ahead and submit your answers. We'll give everyone a few moments. All right, I see that almost 70 of us have participated. I'll give it just a few more seconds. All right, I will end the poll and share the results. So the correct answer, answer is actually three. There are three species of mangroves in the Everglades. That is the red, black, and white. There are buttonwood trees that are similar to mangroves, but they're not quite a mangrove. So great job, everyone. And we have our next poll number two. So that is what type of water do mangroves live in? Do they like cold water, fresh water, salt water, or brackish water, which is a mixture between salt and fresh water? Again, I'll give everyone just a few more moments to submit their answers. All right, it looks like almost everyone submitted their answers. I will end and share. All right, it looks like most of us put the correct answer and that is D, brackish water. So again, brackish water is that mixture between fresh and salt water and they need warm brackish water to survive. You can find them all along the Southern coast of Florida, as far north as Cedar Key on the Gulf Coast and just south of St. Augustine on the Atlantic coast. Great job, everyone. Thanks for answering. So let's dive into a little bit about these undercover groves. They're found worldwide and they are adapted to live in that brackish water along tropical and subtropical coastlines. Their kryptonite is cold weather. In fact, the global extent of mangrove forests 
is limited by the frequency and severity of frost events. That's why you don't see them in the Boston Harbor or the fjords of Norway. And mangroves in the Everglades are, provide a critical habitat for a variety of wildlife. So speaking of wildlife in the Everglades, we have some important of wildlife that visit the mangroves. Invertebrates like snails, mollusks, sponges, crabs, and jellyfish will visit the mangroves, as well as the mangrove roots provide an ecologically important habitat for fish like jacks, sheep's heads, grunts, snappers, and grouper, and it's important nursery area for sports and commercial fishing industries. Alligators and crocodiles have both been spotted in the mangrove forest, as well as sea turtles will use the mangroves as nurseries, receiving protection from predators, as well as an area that's rich in food. Same with birds. Many species of wading birds will visit the Everglades to find food, and mammals like raccoons, minks, marsh rabbits, and of course the Florida manatee will all visit the mangroves to find food. Now, as we mentioned, there are three types of mangroves in the Everglades. You have the red mangroves, the black mangroves, and the white mangroves. And that's an order of, an order of most salt tolerant. This graphic does a really great job of showing us that Florida mangrove zonation. So closest to the shore, the most salt tolerant are the red mangroves. They are known as walking trees, so that's their nickname, with those aerial prop roots that help uh, provide stabilization. Up next, you have black mangroves. They have pencil-like root projections called pneumatophores, which help their roots breathe like a snorkel. You can even see it in the picture. And of course, the most inland species is the white mangrove. They also produce pneumatophores, just like the black mangroves. A really neat lesson that we'll share with you from our education team is all about the mangrove life cycle. So along the coast, you may have seen these large green cigar-shaped pods floating in the water or collecting along the shore. Those are called propagules, just like the one we have on screen. They're much more developed than a seed. They're living and growing while still attached to their parents. But after falling in the water, they will continue to develop as they are dispersed by the tides and currents. They can survive a whole year just floating in the water before taking root in a suitable location. That's oftentimes why you'll see mangrove tree islands out in the middle of the water. Mangroves have special powers, also known as their adaptations. And mangroves are tough. They survive in all sorts of situations that would otherwise kill other plants. Living so close to the coast, they're subjected to stresses like salt water, flooding, high temperatures, and even toxins and pollution in the water. So we talked about their prop roots and pneumatophores. Those help to aerate the soil, creating that force field that protects their roots. Red mangroves perform reverse osmosis to prevent salt from entering, and white and black mangroves will excrete the salt from their leaves, really similar to how we excrete salt with sweat. And because of their limited access to fresh water, similar to desert plants, mangroves can minimize water loss through their leaves during the hottest parts of the day, which is really important in South Florida, as we know. Now, as we mentioned, mangroves provide ecosystem services, which are those natural services uh, that we get from nature. So some of those include a storm buffer. It's gonna help protect the coast from storms. They help to stabilize the coastline by preventing shoreline erosion. They provide critical habitat to wildlife, as we saw in the previous slide. They are important with water filtration and improving water quality, as well as they're really important when it comes to sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. So let's talk about some of these ecosystem services. Mangroves are our first line of defense when it comes to tropical storms and hurricanes. They really are guardians of the coastline. So during hurricane season, the Everglades has provided an essential buffer that slows storms intensity, providing protection throughout South Florida. In fact, during Hurricane Irma in 2017, mangroves in Florida saved an estimated $1.5 billion in storm surge related damage to properties in Florida. 
and spared an estimated 626,000 people from being flooded. Again, we can thank mangroves for that. You can see in this image how the storm surge is really high when it approaches the mangroves, but they act as that buffer, slowing down and reducing that storm surge level. If there was storm surge without mangroves, it would reach the homes quickly and easily and cause flooding. Here is a great video that demonstrates how mangroves are able to slow down that water as it approaches the shore. Always a great video. <laughs> so another ecosystem service is that water filtration. So as fresh water moves through the Everglades ecosystem, it empties out into our coastal estuaries with mangrove forests. They help to filter pollutants, absorb excess nutrients from runoff, and trap sediments in their roots, helping to increase the clarity and quality of waters. And another really important ecosystem service is sequestering that carbon. Mangroves are a carbon sink meaning that they take in more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than they release. The mangroves in Everglades National Park store a lot of carbon in their soils and vegetations. Disturbing this forest could be a bad idea. It would lead to carbon emissions equivalent to burning 190 to 230 billion pounds of coal. So by increasing these freshwater flows to the coast, Everglades restoration will improve the health of the forest, as well as increase their carbon capturing capacity. So that's a lot of information, uh, but here's a quick little breakdown of that carbon cycle in the Everglades. Carbon is constantly moving in and out of our atmosphere through four major processes. That carbon dioxide in the air is taken in by trees and plants during photosynthesis. This is called carbon sequestration. So those dead leaves, branches, and roots containing carbon decompose in the soil. In the Everglades, it's called peat soil, which is frequently covered by water. This oxygen-poor environment results in significant carbon storage. A small amount of carbon is released into the atmosphere through respiration, while the rest is stored in the leaves, branches, and roots of the plants as you can see on screen, especially those mangroves. But these wetlands need to be wet in order to store the carbon. Now there are a few mangrove adversaries out there. Mangroves in Florida are threatened primarily by habitat loss and changes in freshwater flow. The Everglades historic flow was from the Kissimmee River down to Lake Okeechobee and into the Everglades ecosystem. But currently, we have changed and altered that ecosystem where we're pushing more water east and west and less water south into those coastal estuaries. Everglades mangroves have shifted inland since the 1960s, both from sea level rise and reduced water flow. As mangroves start to migrate inland uh, towards safety, another threat awaits. So under the combination of sea level rise, low freshwater flow due to water management and saltwater intrusion, that peat soil that we talked about can break down and disappear faster than it can accumulate. And as we remember that peat soil is really important to the Everglades when it comes to taking in carbon. If that peat soil were to collapse before mangroves are established, the affected area can transform into open water, not to mangrove forest, which means we would lose all of those benefits that we discussed that mangroves provide for us. As you can see in these images, saltwater intrusion is another threat to mangroves as well as the Everglades ecosystem. The sawgrass marsh builds that peat soil on top of limestone, and mangroves develop peat soil in their salty and brackish conditions. As the salt water starts to move in, it can cause sawgrass dieback and mangrove expansion. The freshwater peat soil begins to degrade with exposure to that salt water. And when that freshwater peat collapses, 
the water is too deep for the plants to become established and mangroves will establish elsewhere to restabilize the soil, as you can see in the image. So now that we've gone over some of the mangrove basics, it's time to bring in a scientist who can tell us a little more about mangroves and how they really are superheroes of the seashore. All right, Dr. Minakshi Chaba, take it away. <laughs> tell us a little bit about your role at the Everglades Foundation and what you did uh, before coming here. Hello, Kim. Uh, good evening to everybody. And I must say to you that uh, with all the polls that you did, the trivia polls, your audience is so smart. They had all the right answers. So yes, congratulations right. to everybody on that nice score they did. All right. So um, you asked me about uh, my role at the Everglades Foundation. So I am the ecosystem and resilience scientist at the Everglades Foundation. And uh, as you know, that the Everglades Foundation's mission is to protect and restore the Everglades. So my role is to understand how ecosystems of the Everglades function and how they are beneficial to us. So the number of benefits that they give us is my, uh, my role is to study those benefits. And as for uh, resilience, I, my role is, and uh, my research helps me understand how I can find sustainable solutions that help to make our ecosystems as well as our communities resilient. My I study is also trying to find how Everglades restoration lets all our communities who live here in South Florida become climate resilient. So you see, I publish papers like you see on the left of the screen here and onto the right. I also work with other scientists to find out all about ecosystems and resilience. That's awesome, thank you. And what kind of uh, started your interest in this? So, uh, there was a lot of things that interested me. If uh, I may go back in time a little, I was uh, really first, uh, if you might be surprised to know that I, uh, I used to teach in high school and uh, I had a degree in zoology, that is the study of animals and an education degree. And so when I was teaching biology in school, I would be so interested in environmental problems and the problem of climate change change. And that really sparked my intellectual curiosity to understand more about climate change. And so that is why uh, in um, Florida International University, I completed my degree, a master's degree in environmental studies to understand how climate change, environmental degradation is affecting all of us. And I went on to do my PhD in earth system science to find out climate solutions for all of us, for nature, as well as people. That's awesome, yeah. And we're so glad that you're here joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so an important question really is, uh, what did South Florida look like before development and before clearing the mangroves? And what are some of those repercussions to those impacts on the ecosystem? That's a great question. And I think all of us living here in Florida or South Florida and across uh, the region should know. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, South Florida was really the greater Everglades ecosystem. It's a wetland. Uh, that means that there are plants uh, that st have standing water in them. That means water is always covering their soil. That's what a wetland is. And starting from Lake Okeechobee down to the southern coastal uh, waters, we were all a wetland. And if you would be like a bird and flew up 30,000 feet and try to see what the greater Everglades ecosystem was. It was just acres and millions of acres of water flowing down in a shallow thin sheet very slowly 
from the central Florida region, that is Lake Okeechobee, down to the Florida Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. And as it moved along, it created different habitats like marshes, like pinelands, like mangroves, like estuaries, like uh, tidal bays and creeks and so on. So all those habitats were there because of that moving water. And as they joined the coast, on the coasts, you had, of course, more freshwater marshes, uh, as well as mangrove forests lining up the coastland and further going down more open waters and more ecosystems that were powered by this fresh moving water. If you would take the example of Miami Beach, and I'm sure everybody knows about Miami Beach, and you're showing the picture on the left, and it shows how people were clearing up my, Miami Beach from of the mangrove forests because Miami Beach was nothing but an island full of mangrove forests, lush green mangrove forests. Now people, investors came up from the north and they wanted to create cities and build economic development here. So they said, let's clear up these forests and let's raise dry land. And by the time in the 1910s, they finished clear, clearing up the mangrove forests. You can see the picture on the right, which shows Miami Beach where the mangrove forests are gone, palm beaches, some, you can see palm trees over there. And so this was a drastic a change that took place, which made the dry uh, land dry so that people could live over there, have businesses, you could have beaches. And you know, those, beach, those beaches, of course, were uh, created. Um, and you ask me about the repercussions, because when mangroves won't be there at the coastline, what would happen is that winds and waves would, uh, you know, impact those coastlines, take away the sand, take away the soil and leave that land bare. So you had to dredge up, that is take, bring sand from elsewhere and pile it on again. So the beach that we have right now on Miami Beach is an artificial beach. Why? Because there are no coastal ecosystems to protect the land over there. So um, if you ask me, the most immediate impact of not having mangroves is that we lose our coastal shoreline stability. The soil gets eroded and we lose land, we lose soil. That's what happens. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a great point you bring up because a lot of times when we think of Miami Beach, right, we think of those high rises, we think of South Beach, we think of people enjoying that white sand. But in reality, it used to be a bunch of mangroves and uh, well, a lot of wetlands. And really, that's how a lot of Florida was. So we learned about the yeah. benefits that mangrove give, gives us. And by clearing out those mangroves, we certainly lose a lot of those benefits like the storm buffer and preventing the erosion. Yes, of course, that is, that is also true. <laughs> when you won't have mangroves, oh, the Mi Miami Beach is completely vulnerable to the storms that come in, to the waves that come in and to uh, storm surges, you know, high water that comes in. Uh, I think it was just last year when we had Ian strike some of the water winds from Ian strike us, we had a 17 foot storm surge right in at Miami Beach here. And this is when the storm wasn't even directly impacting us. Wow, that's crazy to think about. So we know that mangroves are really great when it comes to protecting the shoreline, but we also mentioned a little bit about carbon sequestration. So specifically, why are mangroves so important in carbon sequestration and that kind of coastal blue carbon? Okay, wonderful question. <laughs> um, even when I began my research, this was the biggest question on my mind, is that we are facing the problems of climate change. That is, we have too much carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the air. So why are we not using nature as a solution when nature can give us so many answers to all the problems that we have? So uh, as such, like you mentioned earlier, 
all plants, all if you have any plant on the land or in the water, they all photosynthesize. That is, they take in carbon, carbon dioxide from the air and store it in their bodies. That is called carbon sequestration. And all the mangroves do, do the same. If you see uh, the point one over there, it is showing you how carbon dioxide from the air is taken in by mangroves. And they, mangroves and coastal, coastal ecosystems by themselves, if there's any coastal ecosystems, they will be able to photosynthesize more. But mangroves, as you already know, are the powerhouses. They can photosynthesize at much higher rates than any other ecosystem. Right, So they take in more carbon dioxide at higher rate and store it in their bodies, in their leaves, in their branches, in their stems, in their roots, and even sent a lot of that carbon into the soil. You can see the number two pointed over there. You see all those seas in the soil. That's the carbon that's been sent by mangroves into the soil. When the leaves, branches, or even stem parts, et cetera, they fall on the soil. They all get trapped in the layer of the soil. And that layer of soil is covered up by what? The water, right? Because these are all wetlands. So the water, when it covers the soil, that's the most powerful thing that happens here is that it does not allow those that carbon to escape into the air. So it stores that carbon for centuries, more than centuries, hundreds of thousands of years, you have that soil with the carbon intact, locked away, right? So that's a great thing because it's not being sent into the air. Of course, some of the carbon dioxide is sent in the, into the air in step three, when plants also respire, just like you and me, they take in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide. But the amount of carbon that these mangroves can store in their bodies, and most importantly, in their roots and soils is so much that they store the highest carbon uh, out of most other ecosystems. And this carbon, because it's related with water, we call it blue carbon. So blue car carbon is a powerful way of mitigating climate change. That is, by mitigation we mean, we lessen the effect of climate change by removing carbon dioxide, which is the main culprit, which is causing global warming. Wow. That's amazing to know that mangroves are able to sequester so much carbon and, you know, even so much more than other plants and trees. Other, and, and also that about 50 to 90 percent of that carbon is in their soil or in their roots. Yes, we're very lucky in the state of Florida to have these super superheroes, really, uh, yes. that are helping to sequester that carbon. And if I may add that I, I did one of the first studies to quantify that carbon in the Everglades forest. So we have we know that these this carbon is worth billions, two to three billion dollars in amount. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and that's that's part of your role as the ecosystem and resilient scientist and how you work with other scientists and you work with cutting edge technology uh, to research and analyze this carbon in the Everglades. Correct. And as you see on screen, uh, the Everglades Foundation has a great study that's going on that we are conducting. Uh, I, along with many other scientists in the team, we are doing this project called the Everglades Mangroves Blue Carbon Assessment, where we want to use the most recent science and technology to find out how much are these uh, mangrove forests sequestering the carbon in their bodies and in the soil. So we want to find out how much they're sequestering and how much are they storing. So you can see these pictures where we, uh, in our team, four of us, we went um, actually to the Everglades. We took a boat ride uh, from Key Largo in uh, Florida Bay, all along the waters into the Shark River Valley, which is 
just south of Naples. So we went over there, saw these forests, and saw the different kinds of trees. And some of, uh, some of the mangrove trees are short, some of them are tall and dense. You can see these pictures here. They're, they're a beautiful ecosystem, which you would love to visit if you would get the chance to. Absolutely, yes. And there's definitely plenty of places in Florida you can visit the Everglades or yeah. visit the mangrove ecosystems. Yes. And also, uh, you can see in the picture on the right below, we just don't depend on our own selves. We call and invite and listen to many scientific experts who work on Everglades mangroves. We bring them together. We find out about the latest research they've done. We take their advice on how to get these best techniques to figure out what we want to do about carbon sequestration and storage in the Everglades mangroves. So to do this, you can see in this slide, what we are doing, the best techniques that we are using is, if you see the picture on the left, we use satellite images and data from remotely sensed techniques and find out what is the height of the carbon, uh, sorry, what is the height of the mangrove trees? And from the height, we figure out how much is the weight of those mangrove trees. And then we also uh, incorporate field studies. That is when scientists go into the forest and they find out how much do they, uh, what is the measurement of the trees and so on. So many measurements we take of the carbon in the soil, the carbon in the plant, leaves, branches, etc. We also figure out, do hurricanes have an impact on uh, Everglades mangroves? Yes, they do. We will also try to incorporate whether sea level rise will have an effect on how much carbon these mangroves are able to store. And we will also try to add the estimates of what restoration does to carbon sequestration at mangroves. Most likely, it will increase the amount of carbon that's stored in the mangroves Everglades. But we will find that out. And we'll also find what is the value in dollar terms of that carbon that we these mangroves sequester and store. So that is the project. And we are using all the science the best and avail available science that we have to get this project going. Yeah, it's really cool and such a great career connection for a lot of our students to see, um, you know, using that remote sensing data, the satellite imagery, the middle picture with ArcGIS. I mean, there's so much that goes into it and just really great career, career, correct, career connections uh, for the future. Oh. Right? There's so many different ways to to work with the Everglades, work with mangroves and, and do research. Absolutely. And I would say that if you're interested in the science, there are so many aspects and techniques, whether you're interested in the very technical parts, whether you're interested in very theoretical parts, whether you're interested in people and how climate change or science affects people, everything is very interesting and ripe for adventure and no knowledge and actually action really because you can take so much action about things that you care for when you do science. Yeah, I think that really leads into our next question is kind of that action, right? Uh, so what are some of those nature-based solutions? We talk about how mangroves, right, using nature to help some of our problems. So how can they help with climate change, adaption, and resilience? Absolutely. Great question. So that is exactly the question. When I began my research, that was the burning question in me, where, why we're we not using nature as a solution for climate change. One climate solution that you already know about is carbon sequestration and storage. So as they take away the carbon dioxide from the air, they help us solve climate change problems. So that is what we call climate change mitigation. But Mangroves can also help in climate change adaptation. What that means is it they help us adapt to or live with and uh, be able to withstand or live and survive and improved with improve our lives along with all the impacts that climate change is going to have. So mangroves are a nature-based solution in this way. What do they do? They do 
of course, carbon sequestration, but they, when as climate change is happening, we all have more flooding, we have hurricanes that are becoming more and more intense, and we also have storm surge that comes along with it. What do mangroves do? Mangroves are at the front line between land and sea. So they are the ones who actually take in the impact of the high winds in the, during hurricanes or the high water, that is the storm surge that comes in. You just showed a picture of how they tackle that, right? So communities are who are living behind mangroves, they are protected because mangroves, they take in the impact of the high water, that is storm surge, they divert that water away and the communities behind the mangroves are saved from a lot of damages, sometimes that of life, sometimes of the things that they value, like homes or things that they have inside the homes. So mangroves are great in protecting us against the impacts of climate change and hence they help us in adaptation. They, if, even if you have a lot of rains and it causes floodings, mangroves are able to absorb that excess water and are able to uh, avert or that is avoid damages that would occur to us. So in a straight forward way, they are a solution to climate change. We, where we have mangroves, that is in the Everglades, we are always saved. In when you gave the example of Naples uh, and Collier County, you had man those communities in which mangroves were in front of them. However, here in South Florida, East Southeast Florida, we don't have that because we've cut away those mangroves. So we want to bring in mangroves as nature-based solutions. And we have this big project going on, which is called the Biscayne Bay Southeastern Everglades Ecosystem Restoration, which will try and help do that. That is bring about freshwater flows, and bring in more mangroves and into the ecosystem uh, to help us fight climate change impacts along the coast for our communities. Yeah, absolutely. And just like how you talked about on screen, right, there's so many different organizations and stakeholders that are working together to find these nature-based solutions. And, uh, you know, specifically in, in Southeast Florida, where you don't have as many mangroves as Naples or as the Gulf Coast, uh, right. you know, kind of letting nature do what it was supposed to do. And mangroves, exactly. you know, exactly. they're jumping. Great point. To, yes. Coast. Yeah. So that's and great. True. That's a great example. And true. I would also add here that just because you see, this is for all your students, just because you see there is a restoration project, that doesn't mean we have to sit back. We have to make sure that it gets completed. And that we also have to make sure that all the pieces are you know, designed properly so that the restoration takes place. By restoration, they mean that getting all the water to flow down the south so that ecosystems can prosper, right, and thrive. And this project will take years to complete. So it, the Everglades Foundation does it best to make sure all these restoration activities take place well in time so that by the time you're all grown up, you have all the benefits of these ecosystems. But at the same time, I would say, keep supporting as you grow up, learn more about these restoration activities, support them and give it uh, all that you need to learn about them to understand if all these things are happening as you would want them to be. Absolutely, yes, that is a great, great point. Uh, and here's a quick video that just shows uh, those mangroves, especially in, in Biscayne Bay on the coast. Yes, you can see the open waters here. And as you go in, you see the mangroves, beautiful trees. The more thicker the width of the mangroves on the coastline, <clears throat> the more chances you have that they will be buffers against storm surge, high winds, and flooding risks. Absolutely. So I know we mentioned restoration and how there's a couple of different projects on the southeast coast, but there's also projects really all over the state of Florida that focus on 
improving that freshwater flow through Everglades restoration. So, um, you know, kind of real quick, how can these projects help specifically with mangroves in those coastal estuaries? Right. <clears throat> so I would ask you to first look at the picture on the right with the map and all those red, um, you know, the the names written in reds are names of the different restoration projects that are happening. What they're all trying to do is make sure that the freshwater flow from the north to the south is restored as it was before 150 years back. So this freshwater flow going down south is important so that all the ecosystems down below in the south get healthy, and as they get healthy, they will get become more functional and will provide all the functions like carbon sequestration or flood risk or storm against storm risk. <clears throat> so uh, these uh, projects that are taking place, some of them, if you see the Tamiami Trail, if you all know about Southwest 8th Street, it's a road that used to block the flow of north to south freshwater flow. So now we are bridging, we have already bridged some of that uh, road, that is we've elevated the road and made a bridge under it so that the water can flow uninterrupted into the Everglades National Park and into the mangroves. As it flows into the mangroves, mangroves become stronger in their bodies and they're able to take in that storm surge or the wind, uh, winds more easily and they are also able to photosynthesize at a higher rate. So all these projects are helping in freshwater flow increasing into the mangroves and thus increasing the strength of the mangroves. Absolutely. And, um, you know, there's so many different projects out there as we talked about and really is all about all about the water. Um, it's all about the water. Yes, mm -hmm, absolutely. And uh, kind of what we talked about, mm -hmm. a great way to um, kind of spread the word is teaching others about the Everglades. Um, you know, supporting the organizations that are working towards Everglades restoration uh, and just, you know, taking what you've learned today, maybe doing your own research and uh, getting to, um, you know, teach others about mangroves and the Everglades. Yes, I enjoy doing that a lot. <laughs> and as, as I am doing right now, so um, also probably because I was a teacher before, so it was it's really great to connect with students and tell them all these interesting things, listen to their questions, and hopefully uh, they, they will also have that feeling of um, protecting our Everglades, which is in our backyards. They are the, you know, they are helping us fight global climate change. And if you think that it's that big uh, service that they're doing, yes, they're doing it for the world, but they're also doing it for us there. As you came to know today, they're protecting us against hurricanes, against sea level rise, against storm surge, and against flooding. So we need to care about them. And if any, uh, communication or talking about it can help, we should be doing that. Absolutely. And again, we'll be sure to send all of our participants um, some resources, some ways to learn more, uh, you know, we'll be able to share this recording with you so you can continue to educate others. Yes. So we've got some questions in the chat just about how can we help mangroves? How can we be more sustainable in our lives? And a great way is just to reduce our carbon footprint. That, that's true. Um, uh, you know, we hear about climate change and there's a lot of doom and gloom. That is, we become sad and we feel that we can do nothing about it. But that is, there is nothing more, um, you know, something that's wrong th than that. We have, and we have it in us, all scientists believe and they say that we can fix climate change. We can fix it by our behavior change. That is, we can make sure that we don't send more carbon into the air. So we make good choices like, uh, you know, uh, hanging dry clothes or not, not using the dryer, like washing clothes in cold water or taking uh, a walk 
a bike or uh, instead of driving or using public transport, buying local ingredients and shopping local so that we save emissions from shipping trucks and planes, et cetera. Re reducing, reusing, and recycling. There is nothing better than human ingenuity. That means creative, innovative solutions. You and I can both do it, and we can make better decisions. I know it's easier changing the light bulb, but we could also change our diets a little, eat more plants, right? And have responsible and very respectful conversations with people around us about climate change. Talk to them about why it is happening and how we can, uh, what and how we can help get better at this by finding solutions, like making sure the mangroves in the Everglades get restored. So all these are, um, are ways of dealing with climate change and helping Everglades survive. So you have to be the agents of change and bring about this revolution. Absolutely. And, you know, I love how it really isn't about doom and gloom. It is about, um, you know, learning more and telling your friends and also making these choices. And, um, you know, the, the science is out there and it really is, you know, the future generations that are going to be working with that cutting edge science and learning more about climate change adaptation and mitigation and natural solutions with mangroves. And, you know, it's, it's really cool to see that next generation stepping up and, um, you know, learning more and seeing what they can do. <laughs> um, and again, it just really ties back to uh, what we're working towards, which is Everglades restoration. Yes, uh, that's what the Everglades Foundation is focused on. That is restoring the Everglades. And just to repeat myself, what it basically means is restoration creates this capacity of our natural system to store the water. We lost that capacity uh, over the years when we uh, changed our water management system. So what Everglades Restoration is doing is helping to create that natural storage of water so we can store, clean that water and send it south to the ecosystems down in the down below like the mangroves as those ecosystems will get that fresh water they'll become more healthy and perform all those services okay for climate change mitigation that is sequestration as well as adaptation that is preventing storm surge damages and impacts from hurricanes. So they'll do that. But one other thing that I'm sure your listeners know about it from before is that they're going to, as we restore Everglades, there is a direct impact on us. And that is that as fresh water flows are restored, it recharges our groundwater. So Everglades restoration is really important for the most basic and essential resource we need to become climate resilient. And that is fresh water supply for our drinking, for all our purposes. So Everglades restoration makes sure that we can fi fight sea level rise and the salt water that is rising up into our ecosystems, into our drinking water supply, and help to change this course. Absolutely, right? It's all about the water. Everglades restoration helps the mangroves with water, it provides them with fresh water, but it also provides us in the area with that clean, fresh drinking water from the Biscayne Aquifer. So that's a great point to make there. Correct. All right, we have just a few more slides, and I hope you all were listening because we do have another trivia poll. So I will launch it real quick. And it is, which adaptation of the mangrove helps them breathe like a snorkel? So we went over it, right? It's their superheroes. Is it their propagules, pneumatophores, prop roots, or their leaves? All right, it looks like we almost have 
a lot more than half that participated. So get your answers in. All right, I'll end and share the results. And the correct answer is the pneumatophore. So those are gonna be those pencil-like roots that pop up. Now, I, propagules are the seeds that float in the water to help with mangroves. And then those prop roots are those uh, kind of finger-like roots that we have right behind us, yes. And those pneumatophores are gonna help them breathe like a snorkel. So great job, everyone. And we have one more, and that is, why are mangroves so important to the Everglades? Is it that they provide a nursery for many fish species? Do they help protect the shoreline against storm surge? They can help sequester carbon from the atmosphere, or is it all of the above? All right, I think just about everyone got that one right because they're all correct. The answer is all of the above. And I hope you learned a little bit about these uh, ecosystem benefits about mangroves today. So as we wrap up, like we mentioned, we'll be sure to send you some resources uh, about the Everglades, some links and lessons about mangroves. Uh, and we encourage you to learn more, do your research, um, you know, and share with others, right? The more you know, the more you can teach others. And of course, get outside and explore. So whether it's in the Everglades ecosystem, maybe you have a park near your home, uh, maybe you're along the coast and can visit mangroves, or you're in Central Florida and want to visit the cypress swamps. Uh, these are all great ways to just get outside and learn more about our ecosystem. So like we said, there are many organizations out there working to protect and restore the Everglades. Uh, we're a nonprofit environmental organization that works to protect and restore the Everglades through science, advocacy, and education. And again, we'll send you lots of resources about uh, the Everglades Foundation, as well as the Everglades Literacy Program, which is our education team. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Nakshi, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening and teaching us a little bit about mangroves. I know that there is so much more you could teach us, uh, but we really appreciate and have learned so much about these incredible superheroes. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And uh, thank you all for listening. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so if there are any additional questions, feel free to email us at info at evergladesliteracy.org. If you took any pictures from the evening or just want to follow and tag us on social, we do have uh, Facebook, Instagram at Everglades Foundation, as well as the education team is at Everglades Literacy Program, and then Twitter is at Teach Everglades. But thank you all for joining us and hope you have a great rest of your evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you.